I do not believe that God required a human sacrifice in order that he might be made capable of relieving himself of his impossible dissatisfaction with everything that he had made. I don't by any means believe that some perfect sacrifice was required so that God could change his mind about humanity. And I don't believe that God is a salvation vending machine. That if you pay the right price and push the right buttons and it's not sold out yet, you can get your very own portable supply and limited supply of salvation. And oh hey, if it runs out, you might need to buy some more and pay some more and push the right buttons and hope that it's not sold out. I think that the name Jesus means God is salvation. And so why did Jesus die on the cross? I don't believe Jesus died on the cross so that God could alleviate an intolerance he has for human beings violating the Ten Commandments. I think that the reason he was put on that cross was because he was attacking the establishment and was a dangerous revolutionary and he was killed for spreading his subversive ideas. But that doesn't have anything to do with whether something was accomplished by dying on the cross. Because taking that simply at face value, nothing was accomplished by dying on the cross other than dying. And I do believe that something was accomplished on the cross. But what I don't believe happened, what I don't believe was accomplished, was that God opened a pathway by which he'll pretend that he finds you acceptable in his sight. I don't believe that if you grab on to the right, whatever, that hell, whatever the hell right means, if you grab on to the right doctrine, then God will pull the wool over his own eyes and pretend like you're not you, and instead that you are Jesus who he loves. I don't believe in positional justification, where God pretends that you're not you for the time being, and then sanctifies you progressively, slowly over time, transforming you into somebody you're not. And then when you die, you get to be glorified, which is to be transformed in something, into something that you're not. I don't believe God has to change his mind about what it is that he made. I don't think God is the one who needs to repent and change his mind. I believe that John the Baptist and Jesus came and said, change your mind, the kingdom of God is at hand. I don't believe they said, Cling to this doctrine so that God can change his mind about you. God's not the one who needs to change his mind. God does not have a viewpoint where he sees everything as being shit. We see everything as being shit. God has declared that it is very good and he's never reversed that decision. So God is not a salvation vending machine. The name Jesus means God is salvation. He is salvation. And religion tells you that he offers salvation as though he's merely a vending machine. You pay the right price, you push the right buttons, you get a limited supply. 
keep paying the right price and pushing the right buttons and getting your limited supply and hopefully you'll be in supply when you die. Because as mercy doesn't endure forever, it dies when you do. So you better still be clinging to that can of salvation when you die. And if God really did require a perfect human sacrifice, then why not on the eighth day just slit Jesus' throat? Why circumcise him? Why grow up to be middle-aged? Why have a ministry several years long? Why have writings documenting all these things? Why have people needing to cling to a doctrine to prove their love? Why does a God who is love require reciprocation? That would be conditional, wouldn't it? But let's just pretend while we look into what it was that was accomplished by dying on the cross. Let's just pretend that it would be possible to have a very toxic and unhealthy view of God. And let's pretend that that toxic and unhealthy view of God not only impacts your perception of who God is, but impacts the way that you live your life and the way that you treat others. Let's just pretend that having a toxic concept of who God is versus having a healthy concept of who God is can transform what kind of person you are and the way that you treat others. Let's just pretend that God had the ability to be one of us and to come talk with one talk with us and say let me tell you about this wrong concept you have of God let me tell you what God is actually like let me show you what if God could come be one of us and he could show us what God is like What if he could come and he could say not only what he is like, but what it was that we were meant to be, what it was that we were made to be? What kind of people we have the potential to be? What if when Jesus came, that's what was happening? that would make not only his death meaningful, but it would make his life meaningful. It would mean that the things he said are telling us about what kind of person God is, and it would mean that what he said and what he did is showing us what kind of person God is. And it would mean that what he said and what he did told us about what kind of potential we have as people and how we are to treat each other. It would mean that when they bring a woman caught in adultery and he sat there writing in the dirt going, yeah, I know you are there, but I'm not interested in what you're bringing to me. And they wanted to trap him and get him to openly reject the law of Moses. And they said, this woman is caught in adultery. He says, yeah. And. And continues to ignore them. And they said, well, are you going to deny the law of Moses says that we should stone her? So what did he say? And I think this is really what he said. And maybe you've never heard this before. Because it's always been characterized as though it's, let he who has never violated the law of Moses at any point in his entire life cast the first stone. But I think what he really said is, let he who was not a participant 
cast the first stone. Because that would prick them in their heart. I don't think being able to go, oh, you know, there was that time where I kind of took that thing that didn't really belong to me is going to prick them to their heart. I think Jesus said, after all, everyone always says, where was the guy? I think what he really said is, if you weren't a participant, go ahead and cast the first stone. And then why didn't she get up and leave? Why did he have to talk to her continually? He said, where are your accusers? Why? Because she was one of them. What if when he said, go and sin no more, it didn't mean go and don't commit adultery anymore and stop breaking the law of Moses? What if it meant go and stop accusing yourself? What if God could come be one of us and show us what he's like and show us what our potential is? What if when he said, so that you know that the Son of Man has the power to forgive sins, he wasn't speaking of himself, he was speaking of all of us? Because what did the Pharisees say? Oh, only God can forgive sins. What does religion tell you? He declared that he is God. No. He declared, you're wrong. Men have the power to forgive sins. People can forgive sins, and I'm going to prove it to you. What if he wasn't proving that he was God, but he was proving that they were wrong? What if the whole entire time was consumed with proving that religion is wrong? What if he stood up and said, you know this passage about restoration and helping the blind and comforting the grieving and the vengeance of God? Well, I'm taking the vengeance away because that was wrong. You had some things wrong. What if God could come show us how we're supposed to treat each other? What if God could be one of us and he could show us how we're supposed to interact with each other? What if God could come be one of us and he could show us what our potential is and what kind of person he is? What if when he was accused of sitting with sinners. It was not responded. He was not responding by affirming that he was sitting with sinners. What if he was a little irritated by the accusation? What if we've read this wrong and we've let religion spoil our interpretation and create this sick satanic doctrine where God thinks all of us are unworthy and what if the religious people said look at these people you're sitting with this filth this scum that you're sitting with and what if that pissed him off what if that made him angry and said let me tell you about this scum you're talking about they're better than you What if he was throwing sinner back in their face? What if he wasn't going, oh yes, I'm sitting with sinners. What if he was saying, let me tell you about these sinners I'm sitting with. God rejoices more over them than over you. What if he was angry? I can imagine myself being in that position. I can imagine myself sitting with some people that somebody might think, how can you sit with somebody like that? I would not be content to stand up and say, oh yeah, you know, I mean, I know he's a scumbag, but hey, it's my prerogative. 
Maybe we've overly sanitized the conflict that was between Jesus and religion. Maybe we've sanitized it so thoroughly that we've actually reclaimed the very position that he was attacking. What if God could come be one of us and live as one of us and die as one of us? What if the way that we were living was so perverse and wrong and our doctrine and religion was so far off the mark? Hmm, missing the mark. Interesting. That for God to come and clarify and say, here's what kind of person I am and here's what kind of people I made you to be would actually go and get him killed. What if God clarifying, I don't take vengeance and I don't lordship over you. I rule by serving. The love I give, I require no reciprocation. I am fulfilled in the very giving of it. I made you to love one another and to help one another. And all things are equal at the end whether you worked for it or not. I give my reign just as much on the just as on the unjust. And those who labor not get paid the same. What if God could come be one of us and say, you've got a system where you value people based on what they do. And I value people based on who they are. What if whosoever believes on the Son of God isn't merely talking about whosoever believes Jesus is God, but is believing whosoever believes that he is the Son of God? That if I believe I am the Son of God, and if you believe that you are the Son of God, and she believes that she is the daughter of God, and he believes that he is the Son of God. And they believe that they are the sons and daughters of God. What if those are who have what is called eternal life? What if God could come be one of us and tell us, that he's the one waiting on the table and his throne is an execution device and his crown is the sin of the people who put him there what if God could so thoroughly prove that he doesn't take revenge and he doesn't torture people and he doesn't find anybody to be unacceptable by allowing himself to be murdered, and not only that, but, but denying that it was murder, by saying, nobody takes my life from me, I lay it down of my own because I can take it back up again. What if he allowed himself to be murdered and refused to call it a murder, and refused to utter a single word of condemnation or accusation? And what if he rose again and not only didn't take revenge, but took the leader who had denied him and restored his leadership position and affirmed his leadership position in order to prove to us there is no revenge in God. There is no violence in God. What if God could come be one of us and show us what he's like? And what if that is really what the gospel story is?